G'day, my name is Michael Ray. I'm a science writer with SENS Research Foundation, and I'm joined today by Dr. Gino Corpassi. Dr. Corpassi is at the University of California, Davis, and he has been engaged in a career in aging for at least since the early 1990s, uh, and has done a lot of work in a number of areas that are really relevant to SENS Research Foundation, and currently is hosting a number of our students in his lab. So we want to get into all of that. Good day, Dr. Corpassi. Thanks. Thanks very much for the invitation. Yeah. So do I have this right? You have a paper in 1990 where you report the presence of the so-called common deletion. So this is a, a large block of mitochondrial DNA that is just blown out of the mitochondrial DNA uh, and has since become like the most prominent mitochondrial lesion in aging tissues. Was that actually the first report on that? Yeah, it was. Wow. There, there were, uh, yeah, so I've been interested in aging for some time, um, and there have been other demonstrations that there were mitochondrial alterations, like you know, DNA outpocketing, but no, no, no uh, mutations. And, yeah, yeah, a lot uh, of like functional changes in terms of like this complex was up and this complex was down, and right. Were they adequately processing and producing ATP and so forth? But like, were there actually mutations that keep Right. So that was the thing that was new, and and so, um, yeah, the the PCR had just been developed, and I, I thought this could be a really cool because you can amplify um, very very rare mutations with the the polymerase chain reaction, and um, so I said, why why don't we see if there, why don't we test the somatic mutation. Uh, theory of aging, which, as you know, is one of the oldest theories of aging. Well, and the, the mitochondrial, specifically. The mitochondrial and specifically theory. the and mitochondrial one. Yeah. And so why don't we use the PCR to try and find these mutations? And then uh, I was in L.A. at the time, and we had access to autopsy tissues from uh, county uh, autopsies, L.A. County Hospital. And so I looked at an age series of people and found, wow, these mutations are really rising with age. Maybe this could be the explanation for aging. Right, right. Yeah. And you found something quite peculiar about the nature of these mutations. So you find these mutations, and they're not just little tiny point mutations. There's these large deletions out of the mitochondrial genome. And then there's another peculiar feature about them. Yeah. Um, so. The thing about uh, mutations it, it is if they're really, I've been trained in an evolutionary biology lab, and so if they were real and true mutations and not just some artifact of the chemical PCR, then there should be multiple numbers of them. They should be coming from a single mother clone. And so uh, I did a dilution test that showed that when you started diluting these down, they would get to be single clones. And, and so- you just spell out, when you say clones, people are thinking you're making the clones. What do you mean? Oh, yeah, yeah. So what I'm saying by clones is uh, they are related by descent to each other. That's the classic way. So um, uh, what's, uh, what's a, no. So what's happening is not that there's this mutation and that mutation and that mutation and that mutation, but you get a single mutation that happens and it keeps propagating itself and repeating Perfect. itself. And eventually, what you find, in fact, is that it's not just, you know, there's three or four of these, that in a lot of cells where this happens, the entire, the entire cell is taken over by mitochondria and then have this one huge block of DNA blown out of them, just all of them grown out from one original copy. Yeah, uh, so that was a much better description of what a clone is. Basically, what, what it was saying that was that these were all derived from the same parent. And since this wasn't coming from the testes or the ova, they must have originated in the tissue itself. Right. And so, uh, yeah, and, and so that meant that as a consequence of age, the mitochondrial bad things, because these mutations had already been proven to cause disease in humans when you had a lot of them um, were happening. Yeah. 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 And so two years later in 1992, you start to report more on 
uh, what the patterns are on this. And the first thing you discover is there's more variation within an individual mm -hmm. in terms of you know which tissues are affected and which aren't than there are between individuals. In other words, if you've got two 90-year-olds, you know they've got about such and such a level of cells overtaken with mm -hmm. mutations in this way. If you've got two 60-year-olds, you know they've got two 60 or so. You know, like they're almost the same. But within a person, there's only a certain subset of tissues that are consistently affected, which are. Right. Yeah, so, so we, we found that the post-mitotic tissues which are uh, things like brain and, and, and muscle that don't divide very much during your lifetime, these mutations would build up. Uh, whereas cells that divide a lot, like your blood or your intestinal cells, uh, they had very low levels of this mutation. And so the idea was there's this thing in evolution that's called purifying selection, that each one of these mutations confers a little bit of a defect. And, um, and if you have a rapidly turning over tissue, then that gets cleaned out. Whereas if you have a tissue that's with you for your whole life, or cells that are with you for your whole life, those can build up to right. a higher level. Right. And in fact, you also find that the larger the cell is, the more copies of the mutated DNA it is. So it's yeah. like it's just clearing out to expand, take over the whole space. Yeah. Um, even so, there's very, very few of these cells that are overtaken this way by mutations. And so a person could reasonably be skeptical about, you know, there's so few cells, how could this possibly be affecting aging? And so That's right. um, there's a few explanations for why that might be so. You came out with a paper in 2007 that started to explain one set of reasons why that happens. You want to walk me through that? Uh, yeah, yeah, we could talk about that, but I, I would say that that's been overall the uh, the whole. That's why that, that there hasn't been massive adoption of this theory. Is like okay, if you have two percent of your cells that are sick, right? What about the other ninety eight percent? Yeah, it's not good enough. And, and so one could say, but if those two percent are throwing off something that's putting the other ninety eight percent. Uh, uh, off, throwing them off, then that could be a way that this is contributing. Well, and a lot of people who are listening to this will be familiar with a good example of that, which is senescent cells. Right? Exactly. Right now, though, they are throwing out these inflammatory uh, proteins and these proteins that destroy the local tissue and so forth. Uh, you did some studies on cells that are overtaken by these deletions and found a series of changes they undergo that suggest that they might be doing something similar. Yeah, so, so the, the, uh, the amount, uh, the percentage of cells that are senescent as classically defined by the, the two biomarkers of senescence is in that same range of, of about 2%. And so with those cells, just as you say, they throw off these inflammatory molecules that could harm other cells. And so the same thing may be happening with the uh, mitochondrial DNA deletions and point mutations. Right. And you found that cells that are overtaken by these uh, deletions are actually producing certain specific proteins that might be harmful in aging, like one of them is called, uh, or, or sorry, they are reducing their release of some things, like uh, one of them is osteoporogerin, which is uh, really important for uh, preventing uh, bone-destroying cells exactly. from replicating. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's right. by preventing that from being released, uh, you could potentially contribute to osteoporosis. Or uh, similarly, if you had, because again, there is this prevention of some things from being released from cells, uh, that might mean that in Parkinson's disease, where you see a very high number of cells overtaken mm -hmm. by deletions in this critical subpopulation of cells in the brain that produce an important neurotransmitter, that that might actually be blocking them from releasing that neurotransmitter. And so, in addition to the fact that a lot of these cells die, mm -hmm. uh, the remaining ones might be unable to release uh, this key neurotransmitter dopamine, and that may be screwing them up. So that's a, a really interesting way where even if they don't kill these neurons, they can mm -hmm. still be contributing to the disease. Yep. Yeah, that, that, that's right. Um, so the idea is that, that uh, you, you're saying is that these 
deletions, what we we showed in that in that paper was that these deletions were affecting the ability of the cells to secrete proteins that were uh, good proteins, and yeah. so you could, they could be having an effect outsize of just their percentage. Yep. Yeah. 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 Um, I understand that actually you were at an aging meeting very shortly after you first started making your discoveries with Dr. Robert DeGray, our scientific founder, and he had a really dramatic reaction. Yeah, uh, Aubrey was, he was absolutely convinced uh, that this was the answer. And, and uh, yeah, so I remember meeting him in Barga, Italy, which was a Gordon Conference on Aging, and he had already, because he's very mathematical, as you know, he and uh, he had already started calculating the mutation rate, what rate of progression, how long it would have to uh, uh, duplicate in, in, in order to get to the results that I was observing. Yeah, right. yeah, and uh, I, yeah, I think that's one of the um, that's one of the uh, one of your uh, right behind your head. Okay, <laughs> there we go. My no sense. Yeah. yeah, the idea that that. So if you can repair those damages that are happening yeah. to the mitochondria, that that would be a really important way to slow down uh, aging. Yeah, yeah. 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 he actually I mean, wrote his thesis on that basis, and your paper is cited for yeah. So, yeah. Um, okay. Um, you also did some interesting work on a protein that was sort of all the rage around 2000, but sort of faded out of everyone's consciousness, so that you know, a lot of people listening to this might have never have heard of, called P66 shock. Mm -hmm. um, so there was this original report in 1999, if I'm not mistaken, was the first time that the mutation had really been shown to, it looked like, increase the lifespan of a mammal. Uh, we had stuff in worms and stuff in flies and yeast before that, but this was the first time it was a mammal. Uh, and it seemed to be a protein that was involved in stress resistance, to oxidative stress, uh, and it seemed to increase the lifespan of these mice. And then over time, you started poking around in that. And you have uh, two papers in particular I'd like to have you elaborate on. You can take them in whichever order you like. Uh, one of which is where you said, well, how would these animals that are doing so well under laboratory conditions do in the wild? Uh, and the other one was, maybe there's actually something going on here that doesn't just involve the protein we think it is. So whichever order you want to take that. Uh, yeah, the, so, so that was uh, uh, a P66, it's a complicated story, yeah. and so it's hard to tell uh, in a short way. But basically, the, um, the people that made that mouse, they made a deletion of P66 shake but it's really not a very important protein. What was more important in that mouse was that they were decreasing two other isoforms, P42 and P50, P46 and P52. And what that, it turns out that all the benefit for age-related disease is there. And what is the benefit? It seems that it is switching uh, those mice to a more ketogenic metabolism. Uh, more uh, uh, oxidizing fat and then increasing beta hydroxybutyrate. And then, as a consequence of that, we started testing the ketogenic diet in mice and found, found it, it does significantly extend lifespan in mice by about 12.5%, which is a human equivalent of about 10 years, going from about 78 years. To 88 years. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, so, yeah. Originally, another group had published that all of the benefit was the result of just this little uh, P66, but uh, we uh, don't believe that and haven't believed that for some time. Right. Yeah. Well, and indeed, you, you did this paper in 2014 where you actually showed that. So there's two groups involved, but that in animals that were either fed uh, a normal diet or that were very, very, very slightly restricted, just enough to sort of slightly prevent them from getting obese. So there actually wasn't a life extension effect after all. That's right. But that you did get a prevention of a lot of early deaths when these animals were put on severe calorie restrictions. So yeah. it was a very different, very complicated story. Compared yeah. to what the original but I, I think that the uh, one of the things that uh, is right? important about this 
and because this is a flaw in a lot of aging research from uh, the 80s to the 90s to the 2000s is that when you're comparing either flies or worms or mice that live a very short time and you see some gene that makes them live a little bit longer that is not nearly as important if you find a gene or a treatment that extends their lifespan when everyone is living to about a hundred percent of their natural yeah. laboratory lifespan. Because this, this was the, the big thing that should have been obvious from the very beginning from that very first paper was in that very first paper actually their, their so-called normal mice were miserably short -lived. Exactly. And they did uh, one set of animals that got one normal copy of the gene and one mutated copy of the gene and they lived a little bit longer but still miserably short lives and then you had a third group that had the full knockout and those animals lived normal lives and so they said well look these animals live way more than the so-called wild type so this is a dramatic extension of lifespan but actually it was just the other animals were you know whether they were overfed whether the laboratory conditions were stressful whatever it was yeah. you know the, they were showing that they could survive better under the nasty stress conditions. Wow. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, yeah. That, so, and yeah, that's exactly right. I've got yeah. a big run after nothing, which unfortunately has happened. More well, more. but uh, I don't think that it's nothing because, so from that mouse, we have isolated uh, shick inhibitors. So yeah. we, we've made small molecule shick inhibitors. They uh, dose dependently uh, inhibit two different um, kinds of things that happen in aging. One is inflammation and the other is fibrosis. And, and the third, resistance. and insulin resistance, and we just have some new data that they're working to uh, extend uh, memory loss in two different mouse models of Alzheimer's disease. Huh? Uh, yeah, probably through, published? no, not published yet. No. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You heard it here first, right? <laughs> um, great. So, yeah, I mean, and this is like, we could get into a bunch of other things. Oh, I, I did want to cover one more thing before sure. we got on to your work with our students. Um, you were a co-author on one of the ITP reports, and I'm not quite sure what part you played in that. Can you fill us in? Yeah, so, well, the, the ITP is... Actually, is, please explain what the ITP is. Yeah, okay. So this is, so that thing that we were just talking about, the real way to find longevity molecules is to start with a population that's living a long time and then see if you give them something that they live even longer. That's a much more robust experiment. And that's what the interventions testing program at the NIA does. And so I've been uh, a sponsor uh, multiple times. There's one about to come out um, that's been submitted or is about to be submitted that's showing that meclizine which this uh, which we showed about five years ago tell, tell people what they would be using meclizine for oh okay so so meclizine is a drug for vertigo and nausea it's like um, yeah uh, uh, so it's it's known by names of antivert and uh, dramamine uh, also so it's a very mild drug, but what we found was that it also inhibits mTORC1. And uh, it's been shown uh, by multiple people, not us, that if you inhibit mTORC1, you extend lifespan. So this can be done by mutations, and also there's a now pretty famous drug called rapamycin that its target is to inhibit mTORC1. And as you say, like this is a, the, one of the best findings in aging that you can extend lifespan using rapamycin, and now you've got this alternative for inhibitor. Right, yeah, so, so, so the thing that's exciting about meclizine is that um, whereas if you give rapamycin, you can have pretty severe side effects, including um, hematocrit decline, a decline in your hemoglobin and GI disturbances that uh, an older person might want to not want to take uh, if they're 60 to 80 years old. Uh, but meclizine is is uh, really a very mild side effect profile, and uh, in that, um, so we're looking for meclizine and meclizine analogs, and we we with another uh, UC professor we found that they extend longevity in yeast, 
And uh, what the ITP has just found is that me meclizine extends lifespan in mice, male mice, in yeah. male mice, yeah. Which is interesting because rapamycin has, if anything, a more robust effect in females than in males, and yet you're saying that, in fact, meclizine seems to be selective for male longevity, which a number of other ITP groups have shown. Yeah, I, it's kind of a technicality the way it works, but I, I think what may be going on with meclizine and rapamycin is that the very same dose of rapamycin ends up with a higher blood level in the females. But in uh, with meclizine, the very same dose of meclizine uh, gives a higher dose uh, in the males. It just has to do with their pharmacokinetics and their metabolism. Different ways they metabolize the Interesting. Yeah. So that could be the yeah. reason why, well, for the sex specificity. That could be tested for the user. And, and they're, they're testing, so I asked them to test a higher dose, mm -hmm. and they're now testing, we're now in, a year into testing a higher dose of meclizine and also another chemical analog of meclizine. They right. just sent me information a week, two weeks ago, that they're going to be testing scenarios. Which is uh, an analog that's a little bit more potent than that was it. it has a name. Does that mean it's already something on the market, or is that one of the uh, novel reversion that you developed? Uh, no, this is, these these have been in people for sixty years. Huh. Yeah, okay. yeah. But we are also working on novel yeah. uh, mTORC one inhibitors. Yeah, cool. Yeah. And you're hosting a bunch of Send Research Foundation summer scholars in your lab. Um, what are they working on? And yeah, so uh, it, it's not a bunch, it's just one. It's oh, my okay. first student. But uh, Nick O is working, I gave him his choice, working on the Schick pro project and the, uh, the Meclizine project, the mTORC1 project, and he's just decided yesterday he wants to work on the um, mTORC1 project. And what are you going to have him do? He's going to be doing, uh, it's called docking and fitting. So we have a model of the mTORC1 protein that was made by someone else. And then we have these different molecules like meclizine that um, we're thinking that it's binding maybe at a different place than rapamycin binds on mTORC1. That may be why we have a little bit different selectivity yeah. uh, between mTORC1 and mTORC2. And so this is a, a key point that people may know about, which is that there's there's the protein mTOR, but it has two different sort of ways it can assemble. And uh, it is thought that most of the good effects of mTOR inhibition happen from inhibiting mTOR1, and that at least some of the negative side effects, like insulin resistance that sometimes develops, or hypoglycemia, I guess, that it sometimes develops, are the result of inhibiting mTOR2, which after prolonged dosing with rapamycin winds up happening. Now it still extends place, so it can't be all bad, but still what happens. Right. So what you're saying is you think that you've got drug approaches that are going to be more selective for that M4-1 and avoid some of the side effects associated with M4-2. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. It looks like we're about 10 Full more selective for M torque one than M torque two. With basic meclizine, it was yeah. the normal. Oh wow! Yeah. That, so that's an important thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Great. So he is he is modeling basically at the molecular level how these drugs interact with it and trying to get some insights onto the mechanism that way. Exactly. That could be really important, especially if you want to develop analogs that could be better. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well. I hope he does fantastic in your lab. Well, he's he's, he's a good. very smart guy. I mean, you get phenomenal applicants, and he told me, uh, we were driving down in the car today, he said it's very competitive to become a SEN, a SEN scholar, and uh, that it's desired. Uh, they, they want to compete for this. And he wanted to do a computational chemistry thing, and yeah. there weren't so many of those available in his other options. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a good thing you guys met up that way, and that yeah. worked out. Yeah, and yeah, we, uh, we get fantastic applicants who are really blessed that way, and I'm glad one that's helping you out. Yeah, he's a very smart guy. I'm very, very happy. Yeah. Well, good luck and Godspeed. Love you. Thank you. Thank you.